Okay, today I am really excited about the podcast and the episode that we're going to be sharing with you guys. This is just a topic that I personally really enjoy. Um, I've been doing this, I've been investing, studying investing ever since I was 19 years old. Uh, you know, that's about 13 years now. And so um, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. <laughs> uh, I've learned a lot of lessons along the way. And so I just wanted to kind of go over some of the different options that you have. Um, uh, and I think there's really three basic options, three most common ones that most people consider, most people know about. And it would be, um, you know, we're talking about after your living expenses are paid, um, what do you do with the excess money that's left over, right? And if you're not in a position where your expenses aren't uh, being met or you're not having left over, you know, that's okay. The idea is that hopefully one day you get there. And so um, the most common one I would I think is just is cash. Um, another one would be the stock market. And then the third one is, of course, real estate. And so, you know, there are other things you can do with your money, of course, like buy a business and things like that. Those come with their own set of inherent risks. Um, and I think for the most part, you know, cash, stocks, or real estate are the, are the big three that you hear people talking about. And so let's just go. Um, I'll try and do my best of making a complex subject as simple as possible. So... Let me zoom in my screen for you guys a little bit here. If you're listening to the podcast, um, there is a spreadsheet. I'm, I'm doing a video recording as well. That'll be available on the Facebook group. That's Real Estate a University um, on the Facebook group, uh, Real Estate Secrets for Commercial Healthcare Practices. And so um, number one is cash, right? So let's look at cash. Uh, I think that's a very popular place, very popular option for most people. And so the... Um, Typical interest rate, the average interest rate that you're going to get from the bank for keeping your money in there is 0.06%, okay? Not 6%, not 0.6%, but 0.6%, 0.06%, okay? So if you have $100,000 invested in, in your bank account, you will get an annual return of $60. <laughs> so if you put hundred grand in your bank account in the year 2000, and today, the year 2020, 20 years later, you would have appreciated by $1,200, okay? That is not a lot of money for the amount of money that you're risking. It's a very, very low return. Um, I, I think it's all, almost negligible. And so, you know, let's talk about inflation a little bit too because one of the reasons that I personally am not a big fan of cash at all for keeping your money in is because of inflation. Now, if it wasn't for inflation, you know, it'd be totally fine to keep your money in there. But um, the average inflation rate is about 3% historically. And I know what you're thinking. You're, okay, so if my, I have $100, of spending power today, you know, and it goes down to 97, it's not a big deal. And that's true, but we're not looking at this in a single year occurrence, okay? We're talking about the long term because 3% compounding works both ways, both for gaining money in the stock market, but also losing money when it comes to inflation and the decrease in the purchasing power of the money that you have. So to give you a frame of reference, um, you know, in the year 2000, $100,000 would have had the spending power of $148,000 today, right? So think about that. That's a 40%, 48% increase because of inflation. So that means that as time goes on, your dollar is worth less and less and less and less, all the way to almost zero. Back in 1975, $100,000 would have had the same purchasing power as $476,000 today. Okay, that, since 1975, we're looking at a 376% increase in inflation, right? So these things add up. Um, to give you a real world example, the cost of milk uh, 1975 was a dollar 50 per gallon the cost of bread is 14 cents you know these are not everything increases at a linear rate there's some things are variable right so in 2000 the cost of milk went up to two dollars and 30 cents but the cost of bread went all the way up to dollar 72. now it's 2020 uh it's much more than that right you can do the math on your own but the point is that your money if you do not do anything with it will be worth less over time now that being said, I think it is a good idea to have some savings. You want to have liquid, whether that's three months worth of living expenses, six months or 12 months worth of living expenses in cash, you know, that's up to you, right? Whatever your preference is. Um, but addition, in addition to that, in excess of that, you're going to want to start looking at smart places to put your money. So that's where it leads us to the stock market. Now, I think it's really funny. I mean, obviously, I am a real estate guy, but I'm also... A fan of stocks and it's always really interesting to me to see real estate guys argue with stock guys about where to put your money and um, they <laughs> one person always tries to make the argument of one over the other and honestly my opinion is both it's not either or it's and stocks and real estate because 
they each have their own inherent set of benefits and risks. And my personal opinion is that you just, you do not want to be too heavy in any one category. You want to have your risk diversified as much as you can. If you own a whole bunch of residential properties and something happens like COVID-19, for instance, then you might be in a place where you're losing all your cash flow. At the same time, if you are invested 100% in a stock like Tesla, and then they get shut down for whatever reason, um, you know, it could theoretically go all the way down to zero. I mean, Tesla's doing great. That's not the best example. But the, the point is you want to be spread out. You want to be diversified. So I like looking at the stock called the S&P 500. I mean, it's a great indicator of how the market is doing in general. It's a really a great indicator of how the economy is doing in general as well. It's a conglomerate of the 500 uh, top stocks, top companies in the world. And so to do some simple math for you guys, you know, back in 1996, the stock was trading at about 700. So you can see in 1997, right here, we're looking at, um, you know, 6,000 or 600, 700 range. And today, you know, after COVID, after the dip that we've seen recently, the, um, that is, the stock is trading at 3,100. Okay, so, well, when I did this, it was, it was even less. So that just, it shows you how much money you can make. But um, as of yesterday, it was 3,052, 3,053. So the, uh, the rate of return is actually 4.5. So 4.5 rate of return, whoops. Um, there should not be a dollar sign on this. I'm sorry, but yeah, 3,052 divided by seven is going to be a 4.5 uh, multiple time multiple on your money if you invested it in 1996 and what it's uh, at today. So what that means is a 436% return. Now, historically speaking, stocks do typically give you about a 10% return. It's not a great rule of thumb because well, it is a good rule of thumb, but it's not good to think of that you're going to get a, a consistent return every year because it's very very. Uh, volatile. So some years it's up 35%, some years it's down 40%. But on average, it will increase anywhere between 8 and 10%. And that's uh, a pretty good. It's a much better than <laughs> the rate of inflation, which means that you will be increasing your money. So um, in like, so let's look at what this would mean if you had invested your money in 1996. Um, you know, you put down $100,000, well, the value in today would be $436,000, a 4.5 three time uh, return on your money. And I know what you're thinking, well, okay, that's, you know, that's in a, a historically we've been in a bull market, things have been really good, uh, it goes up and down. What if you invest your money on a really bad day? Well, if you would have invested $100,000 on the in 2007, on the absolute worst day, you would still double your money, okay? If we're looking at um, right here, you know, this was trading, this is the very peak of the market back in 07. And it was trading at like around 1500, 1576. And right now you can see we're at 3100. So you would have doubled your money on the worst day, the worst day. All right. Now <laughs> to play devil's advocate a little bit, what if you had put your money in on the best day, like in 2009, if you had waited or if you've been cost averaging your money? Well, you can see right here in 2009, the stock drops significantly down to the 700s. And uh, in today's dollars, that would be after COVID, again, after this reset, we're still not even back up to our highs that we saw before, still be worth $418,000. So the couple reasons that I like stocks uh, is because there is no minimum amount. You can you can buy one share, right? You can buy tons of shares and you can sell it whenever you need to. There's options that you can use to cash flow. So if you, you, know, if you buy a covered call, you start uh, selling options, you can actually make money on your money that's invested. There's a lot of different strategies that you can do. But in general, if you wait long enough and you're patient and you're not trying to time the market, you know, American innovation will always win. At least it has always won in the past, and I am confident that it's always going to win in the future. So I think it's a great place to put your money in whatever size you can. Okay, so real estate. There's really three types of real estate. There's commercial real estate, residential real estate, and then there's REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. Now, let's look first at residential. Now, let's say that you are going to buy a home in the year 2000 uh, and you, it costs you $100,000. Well, here's what's cool about real estate is the fact that you can leverage your money. So a, down, a house that is $100,000 is only going to require about 10% on average. So you're looking at $10,000 investment. Now, let's say that you can get $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year, and your annual expenses are going to be about $10,000. Now, again, these are rough rules of thumb. They do include uh, you know, things like principal pay down. And, but they also include things like your interest and your um, insurance and all the other expenses, right? But if that if these were using round numbers of $12,000 in rent, $10,000 in expenses, you're going to have a net operating income, an NOI of $2,000. 
Now, your cash on cash ROI is really, really strong in this case because remember, you put down $10,000 and now you're cash flowing $2,000 a year, that's a 20% cash on cash return, not to mention the principal pay down, not to mention the appreciation that you're gonna get of the building over time, or the, the, the home over time. Now, however, one of the things that you need to take into consideration is the fact that ev even though you're leveraging your money, you still require a sizable down payment. So the larger the purchase price that the building is, the more money you will need to have to invest. I know there's other ways around it. You can get partners or you can do seller financing, but in general, you're gonna need a, a, a chunk of money to invest and that can be a barrier to entry for some people. So that's just one um, con versus the pro for the stock is there's no minimum amount. But that being said, you are now leveraging your money. So historically, the average rate of return on residential real estate in the US um, and real estate just in general has been about 3.7%. It's been a little bit above the inflation rate, not much, a little bit. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but remember, you're you're getting 3.7% return on the, per the purchase price of the entire house. So you, it is increasing by $3,700 per year and you only put down $10,000. So that's $3,700 on a $10,000 investment. That's a, uh, it's almost like a 37% return on your money. Again, these are just rough numbers, but that's what uh, can make it so powerful. Now, that being said, this is not a passive investment, okay? A residential purchase, a residential home, a real estate for that matter, is going to require attention. A lot of people like to throw around the term, oh, it's a passive investment, you know, passive income fund, make your, you know, make passive money this way. And it's really, really become an adulterated phrase. And people are selling this term so that you buy their courses, you buy the programs, you make a lot of money. Just know that it will take your time and attention. And you have to decide how much your time and attention is worth. So the um, the two, $2,000 that you get per year you know, is going to take some headache. So it may not be worth it for you to make an investment like this if you are making a lot of money at your job and your hourly rate is very, very high, right? Or it might be worth it to you if you just buy a bunch of these properties. But then even then, you're gonna have to hire a manager and the manager is gonna take time and attention. There just There is no way around that, right? Um, that's what you have to be concerned with because a lot of people under anticipate, they underestimate the amount of time that it's gonna take to manage a, a residential property. I, I have several, I know. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be passive, it's not. Um, now that being said, I personally think it's worth it, um, but you got to make that call on your own. Now, one of the things is that you know it doesn't it doesn't scale very well either. So as the purchase price goes up for residential real estate, you your your the fine the finite number the actual dollars that you make goes up, but your percentage goes down. So you make more money, but not at the same percent. So your ROI actually goes down a little bit, even though you're making more money. So what this looks like um, if it if your house appreciated at a rate of 3.7% for 20 years, that means that the sale price in 2020 would be $174,000. And when you combine all the profit, the income that you made along the way, then minus the money that you put down, you know, you're looking at a profit of about $200,000. And remember, you only put down $10,000. So it's a 20 time return, it's 2000%, which is amazing. So percentage wise, it's an absolutely amazing investment. Uh, I think personally, I think it's great for when you get started, right? Like when you don't have a lot of money, um, you got a little bit of time or energy, uh, and you know this is a great way to start building some wealth for yourself when you are a little bit of a do-it-yourselfer. And then over time, you can scale or or grow or move and in, pivot into other forms. Okay, so that leads me to commercial real estate. Let's use the same kind of numbers here. So a purchase price in two thousand of a hundred thousand dollars. Now commercial real estate is different in the sense that it's going to require a twenty-five percent down payment. Um, and so this is, of $100,000, you're gonna be paying $25,000 for the down payment. That's gonna mess with your numbers a little bit. So with the same numbers, an annual rent of 12,000, annual expenses of 10,000, a net operating income of $2,000 a year, your annual cash and cash ROI is only 8%. All right, with an annual uh, appreciation rate of the building, your, your same thing, your sale price in 2020 is gonna be 174,000. And when you add in, when you subtract your down payment, you add in your operating income, then you're looking at a profit of 189,000. Um, that would be about a 756% return on your money. Now, same things though, right? This is not 100% passive. You are taking a little bit of time and energy, a little bit of time and attention. No matter how much it is, how big or little, it's still, you have to figure out, you have to factor that in somewhat and just know that it, that, that is not like the stock market where you literally put in your money and you invest it, okay? And you, and you, you let the companies do their job. You are 100% responsible when you own these. 
So, but you might be asking yourself, well, why would I invest in commercial real estate where I have to come up with so much more money versus residential real estate when I only have to put 10% down? Well, the reason is because commercial real estate is scalable, unlike residential real estate. So it, the value is all based on the what the rent the tenants are paying. Commercial real estate is mostly driven by location. Or, I'm sorry, residential real estate, mostly driven by location. Commercial real estate is driven by the rent that the tenants are paying is called a cap rate. That's how you calculate that. So we can easily get the same margins on a million dollar building. So if I change this around and I change this price from $100,000 to a million dollars, well, yes, now we do require $250,000 down payment, but these numbers start to get a lot more exciting because now we're looking at $20,000 a year in cash flow, which is still an 8% cash on cash return. But the sale price uh, would be 1740000 with a profit when you add up your uh, net operating income over time would be one million eight hundred ninety thousand dollars. Now it's still the same annual returns. It's a uh, seven hundred fifty six return. It's a seven point five return, a seven point five multiple on your money. But um, this required, I mean, whether you're doing one house or one commercial real estate building, it's going to require about the same time and attention. So, you know, for the same amount of time and effort. If you have more money to invest, you will make more money on commercial real estate. So that's just not that one is better than the other. They're just different. Same with stocks. Not that it's better. It's just different and they each serve different purposes. So the final one that I want to talk about is a REIT. This is a real estate investment trust. And I think this is a great combination of both worlds. It's a, what it is is a publicly traded real estate company. So you get the same benefits of leveraging your money that you do from real estate, but you get the liquidity of the stock market because you're investing in a company that does commercial real estate. So if we take a company like American Tower Corporation, for example, you know, we can look at um, what these guys were doing. Uh, right now, this, the stock is trading at $258 a share, okay? And this is a, it's a REIT. It's a, a real estate investment trust. They do um, different real estate properties. So uh, if you... 100,000, so in 2000, the share price was $46, and right now the share price is $253. So what does that look like? It's a 5.5 return on your money. It's a 5.5X. So $100,000 invested in 2000 will be worth $550,000 today. That's a $450,000 profit if you were to cash out your money. So another benefit that I didn't even um, include in the spreadsheet here, but they also pay a high dividend. Usually it's about 4.5% in the dividend. The reason they do that is because the way that the taxes work with a REIT, you have to pay a high dividend. You got to give away what would look like your most of your profits on paper in order to take all of the tax benefits that are very conducive for a real estate trust. And so that's what they do. They, they have high dividends so that they can stay in these favorable um, with these favorable tax conditions. Now there's other ways, of course, they're, they're still making money in, in salaries and, and um, just accounting, the way that they do accounting and stuff like that. But it, both both people win, both the investors and the people who actually run the, the funds and the trust. And so um, now what this means is that, you know, you will not, it is truly passive, right? Like you are investing your money um, and doing nothing. You're sitting back, you're collecting a check <laughs> um, and that's it. So. Again, I, I'm not saying I'm not, you know, I'm not selling you guys on a REIT or, or investing in anything like that. I'm just showing you that there, each scenario has its own pros and cons. Each has its own benefits. I mean, you know, I, we don't even have a REIT <laughs> to, to sell you guys on, but I do personally think it is a great place to park your money because historically they've they've done very very well, and you're taking advantage of both worlds. Um, you know, we we have an income fund personally. Uh, it's you know, it has like a we do a 12 percent, 12 to 15 percent return. So it's, you know, it's nothing like, uh, it's just different, right? It's different than these three things. But in general, these are kind of like your main your main options for what to do with your money, how to invest it. And I know that this subject is complex. I mean, we could literally spend an hour just doing a deep dive into the numbers on a residential building. And we could do an, an hour just on commercial real estate buildings as well. So I just want to give you guys a high level overview, get you thinking in terms of, you know, inflation, compounding interest, appreciation, uh, leveraging your money, some of those basic concepts. Um, yeah, if you liked it, you know, we can, you know, let, let us know. We'll be happy to dive into more detail later. And um, until then, we will talk to you guys next time.